Today's video is sponsored by Bright Cellars. Bright Cellars is a wine subscription service based out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin that sends personalized wine matches directly to your doorstep. After taking a brief seven question quiz, they'll save you a trip to the liquor store by matching you with some of the best wines from all over the world, specifically designed for your taste. The packaging is very eco-friendly and 100% recyclable. Each box comes with wine education cards with helpful information to give you a better idea of what you're drinking if you're unfamiliar with any of the brands. Bright Cellar's blog, Glass Half Full, is another resource that you can use to become more familiar with wines best suited for your personal taste. I was very impressed with the variety of wines that were sent to me. I personally prefer the red blends, so after reading through the cards, I decided to try out the unsinkable. And I have to say it went down smoothly, and I felt pretty good afterward. Bright Cellars has a satisfaction guarantee policy. They also have a wonderful team that will help you with any questions you may have or account management inquiries. Get started today by following my link in the description. Take the taste palette quiz to see your personal matches and get 50% off your first six bottle box. The first time I remember coming close to death, I was in second grade. I was probably seven or eight at the time. I was playing in the backyard with my loyal, affectionate dog, Duchess. My parents and I were never quite sure what breed she was, but I think she was a pit bull dingo mix, judging by her physical appearance. My older sister came out to join us, and a few minutes later, my dog suddenly attacked me. Before I knew it, she was on top of me, snarling and biting my face. I thought I was going to die. Luckily, my sister intervened and pulled Duchess off of me and told me to run back inside. I got back up and ran inside without hesitation while my sister held our dog down. Once I was within the safety of our house, my sister followed me inside, shutting the sliding door behind her. Stay inside, Ian. Don't go out into the backyard for a few days. Given the situation I had just gone through, I listened to her and stayed away from the backyard. A week later, things returned to normal. As far as my dog's behavior went, she never displayed any violent behavior towards me since then. However, strange things began to happen in my house shortly after that incident. Strange is a bit of an understatement. I'm convinced that we experienced paranormal events. They mostly targeted my sister, but I've also had my fair share. There are just too many to recount every single one. But the one that stuck out more than the rest occurred about a year after the incident with my dog. My sister was alone in her room while my parents and I were downstairs watching TV. According to my sister, there was a knock on her door. Who is it? The knocking grew louder. She asked again who it was, but the only reply she received was the knocking getting worse and worse. Ian? She yelled, thinking that it was me pranking her. Suddenly the pounding on the door became unbearably loud, and the door started to give way. My sister rushed over to the door to brace it with her arms, fearing that it would fly off its hinges. As she reached the door, she heard a demonic voice hiss. Come out here. My sister recoiled in dread, falling to the floor and shouting. Jesus! Please help me! The banging suddenly stopped, and a chilling shriek was heard on the other side of the door as the dark presence fled the area. Fast forward seven years later, 
there have been dozens of more incidents in that house. On the day after my sister's 18th birthday, she moved out and into an apartment. Like the good little brother I was, I assisted her with moving her things into the car. As she drove off to drop the first load off at her apartment, I decided to do some snooping around. I found one of her diaries that she kept when she was younger. That's where I made the chilling discovery of how it all began. I flipped through some of the pages and found an entry from my sister's 5th grade week-long field trip to Point Reyes. It occurred about two weeks prior to the incident with my dog. One of my sister's classmates had brought a Ouija board to play with. They encouraged my sister to partake and play along. She became fascinated with the board and even asked her friend to teach her how to make one. When she got home the following week, she constructed her own Ouija board. After she had messed around with it for a while, the demonic spirit that was bound to the board told her that it must take a sacrifice and that it had chosen someone. Me. My sister panicked and threw the board away. After reading this, I came to the realization that the demonic entity that my sister had foolishly conjured had likely possessed my dog to kill me. This was a lot for me to process at the time, knowing that I had almost died at the hands of a demonic force. Apparently, my sister had confessed to my mother about this shortly after these paranormal events began to occur. Soon, my sister had moved all of her stuff out of the house, and my mother told me about the Ouija board and confirmed that everything was true. We lived in that house for another four years before moving to my current home. And it's been almost eight years. I haven't had any more encounters since living in that house. The evil entity has seemingly left my family alone. Although we live in peace, it still gives me chills looking back on what we went through. My husband and I have been through so much recently. And finally, when things had calmed down, I sat down with him and we just talked with each other about all we had gone through. There had been some tensions between us, well, more than just some. It also seemed like he had experienced so much that I hadn't been able to. So I wanted this to be from his perspective. Some years ago, my family and I had fallen on hard times and moved into the family estate. It was a house that was once a church in Alberta, Canada. The place was very spacious and had multiple loft areas above a wide main area. And we stayed there with other family members. From day one, there was a tremendous amount of tension there. And over time, it nearly broke my family. For starters, I've always been sensitive to negative energies my entire life which has pretty much made me a target for malevolent spirits. For as far as I can remember, I've been stalked by inhuman entities, commonly referred to as demons. I've always been able to see their shadow forms when no one else can. I've always felt alienated from my family as they had always treated me a little differently because of this. Unfortunately, my terminally ill mother passed away due to a nasty fall in the church. She died on January 6th of natural causes during the witching hours in the Wetaskiwin Hospital. Now a third of our finances and our grandmother, who had been our babysitter, were now gone. I won't get into why she left, but needless to say, it made things a lot harder on me. So now I had to stay with our three-year-old son and had to quit my second job so now two-thirds of our finances were gone. This happened within the first three months of moving into the church, and it set the stage for everything to come. The first thing that happened was a loud knock, coming from the kitchen area below the loft that was once used by the choir. Every night between 2 and 3.30 in the morning, the knocks continued. I unplugged the fridge to ensure that it wasn't some malfunction causing the sound. I looked all around, and all was quiet. I chuckled and gave the fridge a light tap before shaking my head as I walked away, 
That was when I heard the same tap reciprocated through the countertop. You could knock two or three times, and the same rhythm would instantly be repeated through the countertops. For nearly two years solid, this was the norm, especially when inside the church alone. I knew right from the beginning that it was something evil, but I was unable to do anything about it. This wasn't the only experience either. I had begun to have mild episodes of sleep paralysis. I noticed other family members began to act differently and didn't seem to be themselves at times. And our pets would go wild during certain times of the day or night, seemingly terrified. As the days went on, I could feel a dark presence looming over us. I would stay awake at night until the intensity died down and I could breathe easy again. However, the lack of sleep further caused tensions between me and my wife as our emotions amplified uncontrollably. Being sleep deprived, stressed, and living from week to week really sucked, but waking up to my legs suspended in midair and continuously hearing my wife choking, unable to get a word out, was a nightmare within itself. So I took it upon myself to stay up and watch over them. Right before my birthday, my brother Corey passed away due to a fall in the church. Because of poor planning, his funeral landed on my birthday. Talk about the ultimate buzzkill. His death occurred almost a year exactly after my mother passed away, both dying from a fall inside the church, which was too strange to be just a coincidence. My wife and I have both experienced bad falls while in the church. I had nearly broken my neck one particular time, so I thought it might be better to change where we slept and we moved our bed into one of the lofts. I would sit on the staircase at night during the witching hours, watching over my family. I could still hear the knocks, thumps, swipes, and bangs coming from the main area. Out of desperation, we'd rented out our other lofts to friends because of our financial situation. None of them lasted very long, and most of them don't talk to our family anymore, and understandably so. I didn't know exactly what they saw, but it was enough to scare them away. Looking back, we were selfish to put them in danger. The last friend that fled the house left nearly $10,000 worth of tools behind, with ample time to come pick them up, but never did. Whenever our renters would bring over their friends, things would always seem to be okay at first, but as time progressed, they would begin to act completely different upon entering the church. The loudest, most talkative person would become quiet and reserved while staring off into random corners of the room, and the more quiet ones would become snippy and easily irritated. I know that this seems like a bizarre observation on my part, but trust me, I've seen this process play out several times like clockwork. It is more often than not a sign of possession or demonic influence. All while this was happening, I began to see shadow forms in my day-to-day -day life. As I mentioned earlier, I've always been able to see them from time to time, mostly following other people or standing off in the distance. But this time, they appeared more frequently and seemed to be watching me. There was one form that stood out among the rest. It first appeared like any other shadow form would, but as it drew closer with each consecutive appearance, I saw its true form. It had gray, scaly flesh with a balding head. I would often see this entity pacing back and forth in the loft where the choir once sang. There was a family member living there who had a mild form of schizophrenia. One day, he had a major episode, suddenly trying to grab people and throw them over the railing. I gathered my wife and son to safety and went to the bathroom below the choir loft where our family member had fled. When I caught up to him, he was frantically pacing back and forth, having multiple conversations with the shadow forms that surrounded him. While watching him, I saw his face twist and contort into the gray man's face for a split second. I now knew that it was in sight of him and would not be leaving anytime soon. Despite everything that happened, 
I never stopped believing in God, and though I was gripped by fear on a daily basis, I never stopped praying to Him. After confronting my family member, I fell to my knees, begging God for salvation. I suddenly heard a booming laughter, as if something was mocking my attempt to liberate my family of the evil spirits that plagued these grounds. Our finances might have been terrible, but we had no choice. We could not stay here any longer. I knew that we just had to get out, or something terrible would happen to one of us. Nothing is worth losing the people that I love. The move took forever, but we finally left that wretched place behind. My family and I found peace, and the yelling, the knocking, and the shadows disappeared. A week after moving out, I reconnected with an old friend of mine, and I spoke about my experiences living there. He listened carefully, before telling me about how a priest of the old church had hung himself off the choir balcony. It was for this reason that the church was closed down. It was then brought to my attention that some failed exorcisms had also taken place there. He then informed me that the house across the street had an incident where the owner blew his head off with a shotgun. Everything made sense now. Why the previous owner stayed for only two months before leaving and putting the house up for sale. That should have been a warning sign. After doing some research on my own, I discovered that the owner's wife had died from a nasty fall in the same place where my mother fell. That house will never be a suitable place for anyone to stay there. It is a place scarred by its past. Negative energy contaminates its foundation, attracting wandering spirits and malicious entities. And I hope the rest of my family gets out before it's too late. This story starts at 2 a.m. on the Halloween morning of 2021. My friends and I fancied ourselves paranormal investigators. We went to abandoned buildings and cemeteries, any place where we thought there might be activity. My apartment was ground zero. I have always had paranormal activity in my place, and I even started naming the spirits. Martha came with the apartment, and I've never been afraid of her. She's actually been one of my biggest motivators, even. She gets a bit upset when I leave dirty dishes in the kitchen sink and lets me know by moving the dishes around or knocking things off the counters. It always reminds me to get things done. Doris, the other spirit, came with my bed, which was given to me when the previous owner passed away. Doris seemed like a good name for a lady who snores. Loudly. I can always tell when Doris comes to bed because the whole left side of my bed sinks in. She doesn't bother me either, except for the snoring. And this is the life I lead. No terrifying phantoms, no wailing banshees, just Martha and Doris. But this all changed this past Halloween, when four of my friends and I decided to go to an abandoned town and cemetery. The cemetery and town date back to the 1800s. The town was built by a German immigrant and his wife, and he advertised for other German immigrants to come and live there and help build the town. The original people built a nursery business, and there was a church which is still standing. The town failed in the late 1800s, and the people moved on to other communities. We arrived at the cemetery at 2 a.m. on Halloween morning. The only ghost hunting equipment we had was our phones, which we used for videos, pictures, and EVPs. Yep, we were real sophisticated. As soon as we got out of the car, I had a bad feeling. Like, a really bad feeling. I'm not afraid of anything, except spiders, and I have been to many dark, creepy cemeteries and abandoned buildings and never felt what I felt that Halloween. Shivers crept down my spine before we even opened the gates. That chilling feeling only worsened when my friend Misha set up a Ouija board at a grave that was from the 1800s. I don't remember the name on the first headstone, only the year 1863. We got a few answers to our questions and moved to another old grave. I remember the name Kelly and the date 1866. That one was really sad. Kelly told us that she missed her family 
and she said she was happy that we were talking to her. Just as we were getting ready to move on to another grave, my friend James saw something moving by the first grave we'd been at, but after finding nothing, we thought it was probably just an animal. We moved to the farthest end of the cemetery and were looking for a grave to use the board at when we heard whispering. Again, we checked it out, and there was no one there. This cemetery is out in the middle of nowhere. There are a few abandoned houses nearby, sure, but they are just that. Abandoned. While we were looking for the source of the whispers, we all began feeling sick. Not just with that creeping feeling either, physically sick. Misha and Cheyenne were complaining about feeling nauseated, but as they began throwing up, we decided to just leave. As we were walking to our cars, we saw a black, hunched-over figure floating in the same direction we were walking, and they were coming from the other side of the cemetery. At that point, I started feeling sick as well, and just wanted to leave and go home. We walked faster, pushing through that ill feeling. By the time we got to the cars, we were all puking. The black figure was still coming towards us, and the sick feeling we had worsened as it approached. We got in our cars ready to leave, but they wouldn't start. Two of my friends started to panic, but we tried to calm them down so we could figure out what to do. After several minutes, the black figure just disappeared into thin air. There was no rhyme or reason why it did so, it just ceased to be. And as soon as it disappeared, the car started and we drove down the dirt road as fast as possible. As soon as we had hit the road back to town, we were feeling better. We met back up at my apartment and talked about the things that happened at the cemetery. As we talked, Misha realized that we had not closed the Ouija board properly. None of us knew just how bad things could get making a mistake like that, but we would soon come to find out. We started checking our video and EVPs, and we had some really good EVP. There were whispers and a lady saying something in German. The only word I recognized, though, was nein, which means no. My uncle's wife was German, and she used that word quiet a bit when we would visit them as kids. As we were watching the video that Aaron took, we saw some bright orbs floating around a couple of headstones. We continued watching the video, excited at what we had caught. And then, we saw... It... It was something in the background, dressed in a red cloak. It was moving slowly behind the headstones with the orbs. There were five of us out there, and not one of us was wearing a red cloak, jacket, or a coat. We finished watching the video, looked through the pictures, and then we all went to sleep. We were woken up several times to noises coming from the kitchen. Thinking it was just Martha unhappy about the dishes in the sink, we ignored it and tried to sleep. We all had work the next day at different times and needed our sleep. Things didn't get bad with us until about a week after our cemetery excursion. I was home alone watching cartoons when I heard a loud noise in the attic. It was 11 p.m. and we had had a problem with raccoons getting in the attic. The maintenance guy had put some mesh across the place where they were getting in and they hadn't been a problem for a while. They still came to my back porch and ate my cat's food though. Anyways, the loud noise continued all night. At times it even sounded like the raccoons were body slamming each other. I called the maintenance guy the next day, but when you checked the attic, there were no raccoons. The mesh he covered their entrance with was still intact. The next thing I started noticing was that my dog and cat were acting extremely nervous. My cat has always been a bit squirrely and that's normal, but it's definitely not normal for my dog. My dog is a miniature pincher who thinks he's a Rottweiler. Zeus would protect me no matter who or what was after me. I adopted him from our local shelter because I was having problems with a neighbor who liked to look in my windows. Now, no one gets close to me when Zeus is around. But strange things were happening in my place. Knocks on the walls, bangs in the attic. It was terrifying for my animals and for me. I also noticed that no matter how much sleep I got, I was always tired. I'm normally a very energetic person, but it was getting harder to drag myself out of bed in the morning and I just fell into bed at night. I was so tired that I didn't have the energy to walk Zeus. I would just let him out into the backyard to relieve himself. 
Then I started noticing bruises on myself, and I couldn't remember how I got them. And then one night, the worst thing happened. I had a dream about a very good-looking man. And I know what you're thinking. But just listen. He was dark and had dreads. He had a very nice groomed full beard with the nicest mustache I'd ever seen. His body was muscular, as though he worked out often, and his eyes were a very beautiful dark brown. We were getting busy in a beautiful canopy bed with black sheer curtains around it. The sheets were black satin and so soft and cool. The room was a brilliant red and gold. When the man kissed me, my lips burned, and everywhere he touched me felt like searing flame. I woke up the next morning and felt like I had been beaten with a 50-pound weight. My lips were blistered, and when I removed my clothes to take a bath, I saw bruises on the insides of my legs. It was then that I realized that I had not dreamed of being assaulted. I really was assaulted. I didn't realize at the time that it was only the beginning. Every night after that, I was visited by him, and it was too much. I wasn't sleeping or eating, I was on the verge of losing my job, and I was at risk of losing my apartment and everything I had worked for since I was 16 years old. I finally told my friend Reagan, my closest friend and the only one I trusted, and thankfully, she knew someone who could help me. Her aunt came to see me, and after hearing my story, she yelled at Regan and I for our stupidity in using a Ouija board and messing with things we knew nothing about. Nonetheless, she had a couple of people she knew come to my place. They said cleansing and healing prayers, smudged me and my apartment with sage, and then sprinkled salt around the apartment. After yelling at us a bit more, she and her friends left. They left me a bottle of holy water and some prayers to say. When the people did the healing and cleansing to get rid of the demon, they also got rid of Martha and Doris. I hope they are in a better place, but I have to say, I do not miss Doris's snoring. It's been a couple of months, and so far, things have been going really well. I'm no longer exhausted all the time, and my energy is coming back. I believe a demon followed us home from the cemetery, through the Ouija board connection that we foolishly left intact. That is what was attacking me and draining my energy. It took on the appearance of someone that matched my personal preferences as far as looks go, and assaulted me in my dreams. I want people to know that there are things that should not be messed with. Unless you know what you are doing and have been doing it for a long time, do not go ghost hunting and absolutely do not use a Ouija board. My ghost hunting days are over. I will leave it to the professionals. But if you insist that this is the path for you, please, whatever you do, research heavily. Don't go in unaware and unprepared like we did. Remember this, if you're looking for something from the other side, Chances are, there's something peering right back at you. So you may look at the name Pablo Hernandez and think that I'm of Hispanic descent. This is not the case. I'm actually Bulgarian. I've submitted this story under a pseudonym for privacy reasons. For some context, I was 16 when this happened and am now 24. I've never talked about this to anyone except those who were present at the event. This experience has left me scarred, and I think it will stick with me until the day I take an eternal nap inside of a coffin. When I was a teenager, I never really talked to anyone outside of my family, and I grew up in a small town in southern Bulgaria, which was completely isolated and surrounded by mountains. Being a small village, everyone knew each other. On the day in question, it was my cousin's birthday. News travels fast in our small town, so everyone ended up attending. That's just the way things were there. When I arrived, people started jumping off the roof into the pool, drinking, smoking, the usual stuff. There was even this one guy who was cooking meth in one of the rooms and was promptly thrown out after it was discovered. After the party died down, my cousins and I, along with a couple of her friends, stayed up for a while longer. My cousin then pulled out an old Ouija board that my aunt had bought for her on holiday while she was in the United States. Side note, Bulgaria is far from a third world nation, but it lacks most of the amenities of western countries, 
Ouija boards, a good one, is hard to come by. So in other words, this was kind of a big deal. Back then, I wasn't really a believer in ghosts or the paranormal. and would usually make some wise-ass remarks on the subject. I thought it was complete bullshit. However, what happened that night has changed everything. But at that moment, I didn't believe some piece of crap wooden board could conjure anything from the afterlife. We all sat down in the living room in front of the sofa and set everything up. I got this gut feeling that something wasn't quite right about this board. I was half tempted just to throw it in the trash. When everything was ready, I was the first one to ask a question. <laughs> Can you give me a haircut? I said as a joke to break the tension. But the girls started chastising me and said that I could get lost if I wasn't going to take this seriously. Psh, fuck this, I'm out of here. Before I could leave, my cousin chimed in. No, wait, can you just stop being an ass and go along with it? It's my birthday after all. After the guilt trip, I reluctantly sat back down and watched them move the planchette from letter to letter. I ended up dozing off when suddenly I was snapped back to reality by my cousin screaming. She screamed so loud that I bet the guy high on meth could hear it wherever he was. I sat up and saw that she was crying. I then noticed that her arm had been badly bruised, or rather, scratched. At first, I thought they were just messing with me, but I soon realized that my cousin was genuinely scared out of her mind. I'm throwing this fucking thing out. I picked up the board and threw it through the open basement door. It landed at the bottom of the steps with a thump. I then sat back down and asked what had happened. It scratched her. What? You were sitting right there. We made contact with something and it scratched her. The girls helped my cousin up, and they all went into her bedroom, leaving me by myself. After staring at the open basement door for a while, I decided to call it a night. I grabbed some snacks from the kitchen and sat down to watch TV. At about 1.30 a.m., my eyes were getting heavy, so I stretched out on the couch and closed my eyes. After a few moments, I heard these painful scratching sounds like long steel nails being dragged across wood. I got up and made my way over to where the sound was coming from. I hadn't realized it, but I found myself at the basement doorway again. I opened it without a second thought. The moment I did, there was nothing. It was just a dark, silent, motionless basement. I was too tired for this shit. So I went to my cousin's bedroom. To my absolute astonishment, the three of them were all sitting on the floor, moving the planchette across the Ouija board. Pfft, really? You're messing with that thing after what happened? They all looked up at me. But before anyone could respond, we all heard a loud cracking sound coming from down the hallway. I rushed back into the room I had just come from. The basement door was completely destroyed. Something had smashed it right off its hinges, sending the pieces down the basement steps. We rushed to the basement doorway. Everybody stay behind me. We'll all go down together. I grabbed a candle that was resting on the dresser next to the doorway and had one of the girls light it up. And together, we all descended the creaky steps. As soon as we got to the bottom, I got this awful feeling. Something was down there with us. Something evil. My guts felt like melted ice cream. Don't ask me how, but I somehow knew something was on the ceiling above us. I was scared to look up, but I had to. The dim candlelight revealed a dark form above us. It clung to the ceiling like a spider. I then saw its horrifying face staring back at me. I fell backward and said, Everyone get the hell out of here. Now. I led the girls back up the stairs and into my cousin's bedroom. After a while of pressing myself against the locked door, 
my heart beating out of my chest, and listening to my cousins and her friends bawl their eyes out, I slid down against the door and dozed off. Looking back, it was a dumb decision to stay in that house, but I don't think I could have been rational after what I saw. To this day, I still haven't got an explanation as to how the Ouija board went from the bottom of the basement steps to my cousin's bedroom. None of the girls remembered my cousin being scratched earlier in the evening. Otherwise, I don't think they would have messed with the Ouija board again. That night has changed everything for me. I am now a firm believer in the paranormal and demonic forces. There's always a reason to be afraid.